Hello out there and welcome to the No Shit Cast, the flagship podcast of the X-Factory Creative Network. I'm your host, Matt Frazier. Tonight's guest, Mr. Ken St. Andre, an American fantasy author and game designer, best known for his work with Tunnels and Trolls and Wasteland. He's been an active member of the Science Fiction and Fantasy Writers of America since 1989, and he'll be our guest. My co-host tonight, the great wizard of history himself, Mr. Eric D. Smith. How you doing, Eric? Good. How are you doing, Matt? So a um, uh, little bit of housekeeping, and then we're going to jump right straight into the conversation with, uh, with Ken here. Um, so the March 1st rollout for the website is well on track. Uh, Eric and I have, uh, uh, Tangent gave us the chance to kind of peek behind the curtain, and we've seen uh, what the website's going to look like, and it's flipping fantastic. Um, you know, uh, just unbelievable, um, the, uh, the support and everything that we get from Tangent and the X Factory. They've given us a nice little cozy home to park our podcast on. Um, and it's just been a wonderful collaboration so far, but, uh, and, uh, who we got coming up here, Eric, uh, a couple guests coming up here in the future. Well, on the 3rd of February, we have Steve Sullivan, who is an American author. And on the 10th of February, we have DJ version 666, professional musician. Right. On the 17th of February, we have Dr. Cooperman, who is, um, a professor of English and playwriting. And on the 24th of February, we have Skip Williams, who is a game designer. Awesome. And on March 3rd, we have Muggsy, the Reverb Nation's number one hip-hop artist in Sydney, Australia. Right. Yeah. Crazy interviews, huh, coming up? Definitely. Good fun. stuff. So um, without further ado, we want to kind of just jump straight into it. We were really excited about our guest tonight. Um, so, uh, Ken, how are you doing this evening? I'm doing great, thanks. Uh, thanks for calling. Well, we're really glad you uh, took this time to be on our show, pal. Um, um, we're really honored to have you. Um, I know uh, uh, Eric and I have uh, w- we're excited about this uh, this interview here coming up. But um, we'd like to start out with um, what kind of where where did it all begin for you in um, the whole fantasy genre? Was it something that you that you were into as a kid, or kind of give us an idea of, of where it began for you? All right, I can pinpoint that, actually. I don't remember the exact date, but it was summer of my seventh grade year, uh, between sixth and seventh grade, when I lived in Sunny Slope, Arizona, not yet part of Phoenix. I had the tendency to ride my bicycle around a lot in the summertime, and uh, one day I rode fairly far and discovered a little sign that said, Sunny Slope Public Library, and... I said, oh, a library. I'll go see what's there. I just rode up to it, went inside, explored the bookshelves, and found Tarzan and the Ant-Man by Edgar Rice Burroughs. <laughs> uh, so I got a library card on the spot, checked it out, took it home. Great story. Tarzan gets shrunk to the size of a, a, a cricket, basically, and goes in and has an adventure with... Uh, medieval warriors living in a big termite mound in Africa. That hit you hard, didn't it? That did. (laughs) From then on, I was always looking for Tarzan stuff. And Tarzan led me into a whole world of fantasy, science fiction, and so forth. Uh, In high school, I discovered a Gnome Press Conan book on a bookmobile shelf parked behind a shopping center one day, and that got me into Conan. So I was reading Tarzan, Conan, and after I found Conan, every piece of fantasy fiction I could find um, before I hit college. Wow. What ended up being your uh, favorite at that time? Really hard to pick. I like both of them so much. Uh, Tarzan is probably the number one because he was first. Conan is a very close second. And that was... I have read practically every sword and sorcery or major heroic fantasy story you can think of written before about 2010. 
So obviously you were a fan of Tolkien and, and uh, the Lord of the Rings and The Hobbit and that stuff as well? I saw them in the first uh, unauthorized Ace Editions before Valentine went and made it all legal. Now, what's wow. that? what does that mean? You, you saw them in the – can you explain that? I a read them. Bit? No, I, that's what, but what, what was Ace, – Ace Books found that the copyright date had lapsed. The copyright protection had lapsed on the Lord of the Rings stuff. Wow. So they reprinted it because it was right in the middle of a big fantasy boom around 1968 or so. Huh, I didn't know that. I didn't know that either. Huh. So, so they printed it. They were unauthorized, and it made a big stink because the Tolkien estate jumped up and down and said, hey, that's not right. Yeah, I can imagine. Right. And, can uh, imagine. and they, they sued, and Ace had to withdraw the things from the market, and Valentine paid the Tolkien estate considerable money and reprinted them all in the authorized editions so is is uh, i would assume then that having having the quote unauthorized editions is now some sort of collector's item i don't know no <laughs> <laughs> i'm not even sure i have them anymore <laughs> there's so many books here <laughs> and, and, and so many of them are inaccessible actually yeah. i'm doing a project of uh trying to get rid of one a day Every day I pull a book off, a uh, paperback book off a bookshelf that I have here, put its picture on Twitter and Facebook, and say, you can have it for postage. <laughs> uh, so far, two people have taken me up on it on about 20 books I've offered. Wow. Well, I, I have to assume it, that people don't know what the good fantasy stuff is. Oh, yeah. no. Every time I see that, I absolutely want to do that. But I've got like six bookshelves right now that are beyond double stacked and straining. And I work at a library, so I mean, a couple of days ago, I took home 29 history books from a professor who left the uh, university. So I just, oh my God, I I need to have more space or something. <laughs> but I understand what you're saying, like not being able to access them or necessarily even see them. <laughs> even see them. There are boxes that I haven't unpacked for 10 years. Wow. The cool thing about these books that I got was they all said uh, for professor evaluation only not to be resold. And to me, that was like having that 45 or that CD that said DJ promotional use only. <laughs> I it thought is. it was awesome. <laughs> Pre-publication stuff. Yeah. 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 When I reviewed for library for journal back when I was a librarian, I got a lot of that stuff, too. Um I think probably the prime stuff was uh, novels by Larry McMurtry. Wow. I'm not familiar. That, I've not read any of those books, but I've seen them before. Well, he was a big name in American fiction back around the turn of the century. You, When you were talking about the things that really hit you hard at that age that set you on this course, um, and I know that some, uh, for me, it was Rogers Lasney and Michael Moorcock with the Amber series and the Elric saga, uh, respectively. And uh, did you read those two at that time? And, and how did those particular books impact you, especially the Michael Moorcock books? Because I know that, you know, you uh, worked with and made the game Stormbringer. And did you make Hawk, uh, Hawkmoon 2, the first edition? No, somebody okay. else wrote the Hawk Moon. Okay, game. that's what I thought, but I wasn't sure. But uh, I was curious, Did you was you involved with Stormbringer because it's something that you wanted to do or that you, know, you were hired to do? Did you? I discovered Michael Moorcock fairly early because, like I said, I was actively searching for all the fantasy I could find, and I thought he was great. Uh, Stealer of Souls was the first collection of short stories published by Michael Moorcock, and I had a copy in hardback. And uh, I realized that what Moorcock had done was turned the Conan barbarian legend upside down and shook it all out and, you know, done the complete opposite. And it was still just as great in the way of fiction and fantasy as the Howard's work. So... I became a big Elric fan right there from the Steeler of Souls. And when uh, Warcock went on and got uh, a long novel-length Stormbringer second book put out, I had that too. And at the time, that was all that had been done. 
from Elric, and he hadn't even started on Hawk Moon or Corum or any of his other, other series. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Zelazny was a friend of mine. Oh, wow. One afternoon, my friends and I were gaming, and we started talking about the Amber series that we liked so much because we had been reading it from the beginning. As each book came out, we even sent Roger a letter saying, that wasn't really Brand, was it? that you killed. It was a shadow of him. <laughs> and Roger went, what? You figured that out? I said, well, yeah. <laughs> it's a shadow. <laughs> the hints are all there. Yeah, yeah. You're not going to kill off a Prince of Amber that easily. No doubt, no doubt. So we were already Selassie fans. And when I say we, I mean me and Liz Danforth and Mike Stackpole and Bear Peters and a couple of other people who were in the group at the time. And I said, you know, I could make an Amber game that we could all play face-to-face. -face. And they said, no, you couldn't. I said, sure, I can. Uh, we'll just decide on who's going to be what characters. We'll turn in your orders to me like diplomacy orders. And uh, I'll be the game master and adjudicate it and tell you what happens. And then we'll just do the storytelling from there as it develops. That sounds moment fun. Moment by moment, hour by hour. That's, that sounds like great fun. <laughs> so we wrote to Roger and said, we're going to do this. Can you help us out with a map of Amber? And that's when he created the first map of Amber. Wow. Now, have you... After that, we, uh, Mike and I went to Kublai Khan in Denver one summer. Con committee invited us. And a bunch of us from Phoenix came, Liz and Pat Mueller and Mike Stackpole and I all went to Kublacan. We stopped by Santa Fe and saw Roger on the way. We saw him again in Denver because he was the guest of honor. And we competed with him in the Trivia Bowl contest that was sort of the climax of the whole convention. The final two teams wow, was my night, my team. My team, the Knights of the Iguana, and Roger's mm. team, uh, the Warriors of Shadow. Nice. <laughs> he lost. Uh. My team, my team beat him. <laughs> <laughs> Fantastic. Uh, but, oh, oh God, we loved Roger Zelazny. <clears throat> I've, I've heard uh. nothing but good stories about him. He seemed to be a very generous person. Um, yep. He was. The time and he was stuff. an amazing man. I, I heard that him and um, um. George R. R. Martin game together. It's possible. Um, Roger never told me anything about his gaming. Well, I would see him at science fiction conventions, oh, maybe once or twice a year. Yeah. That was like in the last oh ten years or so of, of Roger's life. He died tragically young from prostate cancer. Yeah, yeah. So, um, Ken, when did it start with you? For where you was it after college that you started doing um, writing and then game design and stuff like that, or how, how does that kind of fit in to the story? I've been writing since I was, you know, in grade school. I was always wanted to be a writer. I've been game designing pretty much all my life. Oh, I would tend to make fantasy variants of games that I already knew how to play. Probably the first game I designed was to turn uh, the regular Monopoly game into a race game. Hmm. After all, you're rolling around uh, a a track Basically, sure. from a start to yep. a finish line, uh, and you'd have a lot of obstacles on the way. So right. anything that wasn't a regular business was an obstacle, and it would delay you. So you just repurposed the game, basically. I did. I just yeah. took the game that we already had. You had pieces. You had a board. You had dice. Um, and I said, let's turn it into a race game. <laughs> uh, and the object of the game is to get around the board first. Later on, I made a variant of chess. I wanted to do, after I read Edgar Rice Burroughs' Chessmen of Mars, I said, yeah, I want to do combat chess. <laughs> yeah. Not just one piece takes another piece. So this is how I'll work it. The attacking piece gets three dice. The defending piece gets two dice. And the hive uh, score wins. That's interesting. Yeah, it's quick, too. It's quick combat resolution. 
Yep. It's a quick combat resolution, and uh, the attacker retains the initiative, but can be defeated by a particularly stout defense. Right. It adds a de- it definitely take it adds a whole new dimension to an already existing game, right? Because in in chess, the attacker always wins. Right. But now, but that's in, not in Ken's true. combat chess, uh, you uh, think twice before you take a pawn with your queen or something. <laughs> it makes yeah. it infinitely more complex, is what it would do. Sure. I mean, because, so I mean, those were like tactics. two of the first games I invented in high school. I made a, a Tarzan jungle game. A John Carter of Mars game. Told you I love Burroughs. And uh, created little stand-up cardboard figures, drew a map board, put obstacles and uh, treasure spots on it, and set it up as a combat thing where one guy would play uh, the hero and his allies, and the other would play all the villains. Those games did not survive. What uh, board games did you regularly play growing up that, influenced the designs that you were doing at that time other other than monopoly and like was there like when you started getting you know, monopoly was or... just about the only board game there was when i was growing up i was born in 1947 yeah by the time i reached high school what was beca- getting to be big was war games strategy and tactics um waterloo uh, battle of the bulge my friends and i played the uh, war games from Avalon Hill, practically every weekend. What titles did you guys enjoy? Battle of the Bulge. <laughs> Waterloo. Yeah, the ones Let's I can okay. remember. Uh, <laughs> tactics, squad leaders. Gotcha, gotcha. Um, we didn't get to the super giant games that came later. My friend Mike Waters invented a miniatures game using uh, toy soldiers and he made his own little cardboard houses and things and toy tanks and other things. And we crawl around on the floor after his parents went to sleep at night, running our American soldiers versus our German soldiers, you know, uh, shooting at each other, rolling the dice to see, you know, whether we hit or not. Yes, yeah, very. Completely divorced from the miniatures movement, you know. We didn't have a real miniature in there. All of our uh, soldiers were uh, toys that we bought in uh, bags of uh, 10 or 15 at a time at a uh, 5 and 10 cent store. Like the little army men. Little plastic yes. army men. Yep. Sure. Little plastic army men. You can still find them. It's very uh, uh, H.G. Wells sort of a situation. And before that, I made up my own army game in which where uh, two players got on opposite sides of the living room or something and lined up their troops in a battle line in front of them. And then we had a marble. And you would shoot the marble across the living room and try to knock the other guy's player down. Oh. That was a kill. So that was a game of skill. <laughs> yeah. Right. Yeah. Sure. Yeah, I think uh, in uh, Little Wars they talk about stuff like that, too, where you can, like, is it uh, shooting matchsticks or maybe pop bottle caps or something of that nature? I can't remember, but that was another mechanism I was reading about in some of the early miniature games of that nature that took place like in, in your living room or such. It's funny. I'm, we, I'm sure different people would come up with different ways of doing it, depending upon what tools or toys they had at hand. I think I had marbles. I played marbles yeah. all the way through grade school. Wow. And uh, at recess, we weren't out there running on the, the merry-go-round or the slides or other things. We had a big circle drawn in the dirt over there and, Four or five of us were trying to steal each other's marbles. Wow. Yeah, I I seen some of that when I was young and in school, but that stuff dropped away really quick as I was going through school. But I do remember there were some kids that still did that, and and it looked really cool. I mean, um, and I can see, like, all of this stuff in your life is the, the games and how you're interacting with them and how you're reflecting things exponentially, like, the movies and the books that you read into the games and stuff. When, what was the first published game that you ended up doing or first gaming company that you worked for? Like, how did you, uh, after all of that, solidify and land into that vocation? Okay. So you understand that I was a member of fandom, science fiction fandom, from the days when, the only way to communicate was by letter. 
Or if you were super rich, you might give somebody a phone call using long distance on AT&T. But I was a member of fandom. There was a science fiction fanish group that I helped start in Phoenix called the Cosmic Circle. That would meet every Friday night to get together and play games and discuss science fiction and uh, drink pop and uh, eat garbage and have a good time. Uh, this was all going on for me when I was young, college age. So one night, in 1970, well, in late 1972, I started hearing about this game that I will only call that other game. Gotcha. Yeah, gotcha. understood. Uh, so I started hearing about that other game, and I said, wow, this sounds great. That's just the kind of game I would really love to play. But I was hearing about it from Los Angeles, and I'm in Phoenix. Okay. So nobody had it. Nobody knew what it was. Eventually, um, I went to um, Rick Loomis's house one night to join in a Friday night gaming session. And somebody, can't ever remember his name, had just acquired the white box edition of that other game and brought it along to show off. And it was sitting there on the table. I got there late, and I missed being in the Risk game. You asked about board games that had big influence? Risk yeah. and Diplomacy are the two main Yeah, ones. Risk, sure. So I got there late, missed the Risk game, saw that other game, and sat down and started reading it. I couldn't read the whole thing in the time I had. The print was small. A lot of it didn't make sense to me. It was a miniatures game. Mm -hmm. I had... <clears throat> closest I came to playing miniatures was the thing I did with Mike Waters with the Army soldiers. So after about two hours of reading through this thing, I went, I understand what they're trying to do. What a great idea. What a rotten way to do it. <laughs> I will go make something that I can play. First of all, what is these D20s and D12s and D4s and stuff? I've never seen any of those poly dice. Did not exist in Phoenix in 1973. And probably um, had no, no way to know even how to get them at that point in time, yeah? I had no idea how to get them. I'm going, you know, this crap is impossible. <laughs> so, instead of worrying about how to get dice, I said, I'll just use the dice I've got. Six siders. They're easy to get. Monopoly. Yahtzee. <laughs> Inspired, I went home and I went to the library and checked out every book on medieval weapons and mythology monsters I could find and went home and made lists and sat down and remembered what I had been reading the night before, and I said, what makes sense and what doesn't? Describing the characters with attributes, that really makes sense. The attributes they have, well, strength, that makes sense. Constitution, that makes sense. If they have constitution, why do they have hit points as a separate thing? Throw that out. Uh, intelligence, that makes sense. Uh, wisdom. What is wisdom good for? Uh, if you had any wisdom, would you be going into holes in the ground to fight monsters? <laughs> I said, that's stupid. Let's throw that out. Uh, what can replace it? Luck. Luck is the best thing in the world. Luck will save you when nothing else will. Yep. Likewise, luck will kill you when nothing else will. <laughs> Badly, yeah. <laughs> you you got to take the bad with the good, right? Yeah. Dexterity, yeah, you have to be able to coordinate your body. Uh, charisma, sure, that sort of makes sense. Okay, that's six, that's good. I'll use those. So I worked for about a week putting together lists. Um, I had a friend come over, and we talked about making magic spells, and we just uh, invented a bunch off the top of our heads. I had not even looked at the spell section of that other game. It was a fantasy game. There had to be magic. I put spells in. Uh, right. My friend Steve McAllister helped me. We sat there for one afternoon and just brainstorming and writing down anything that sounded logical. Right on. So that's still most of the spells in Tunnel Controls came from that one afternoon. And I'm sure the, in that 
within that mythology, those spells have become a bit legendary. Some of them have. Uh, we put funny names on them because, well, you can tell I, I don't take anything too seriously. <laughs> so we wanted a, a spell that would kill things, right? How should we do it? I said, well, the better the wizard, the more deadly the spell should be. The wizards have to be smart. So let's use intelligence as the kill factor there. And uh, we made uh, spell casting gestures, and uh, I think Steve said, oh, take that, you fiend. <laughs> and I said, that's a great name for a spell. We put that right in there. So the spell, <laughs> the primary fighting spell, combat spell in Tunnels and Trolls is called Take That, You Fiend, because you're literally casting deadly energy from your fingertips at your foe, and that energy is powered by your intelligence. If your intelligence is 10, you cast 10 points of damage. If your intelligence is 20, you cast 20 points of damage. Wow. If you power up the spell to second level, you do twice as much damage. If you power it up to third level, you do twice that much. So the spells increased in power logarithmically. Huh. That's interesting. Which means, you know, tunnels and trolls wizards kick the poop out of uh, that other game's wizards. Right. <laughs> and it sounds like it, w it would be a lot m more sim uh, easier to play, too. Right. It is a lot easier to play. It goes so much faster. Yeah, it's a bit more of a, a universal rule system in conception from the beginning, whereas, you know, from what I understand of Dungeon, yeah, the other game, <laughs> um, it's like a collage of different techniques for different situations. You know, for, That's exactly for, what it is. Yeah. That other game is essentially a miniatures game with role-playing elements grafted on top. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Tunnels and Trolls was designed to be a role-playing game, a storytelling game from the beginning. We never, I never even gave a thought to miniatures. So your goal was as to, a part of the game was to kind of keep the rules out of the way and and allow it to be a mechanism through which you could really tell interesting and amazing fantasy type stories through. Right? Is that what I'm hearing you say? That's what we figured it out to be later. Okay. But, uh, in the beginning, Tunnels and Trolls was meant to be. Yes, a storytelling game where the characters were more like uh, medieval and mythological superheroes than Napoleonic soldiers uh, marching in line. Now, did you find that that was more appealing to people in the end? Like, I know you started off, if, I, if I'm correct, with about 100 copies of this game, right? Right. I, when, when, I, when I finally got a about 40 pages of rules and tables and things written. There were people asking me for them and trying to photocopy my typewritten uh, notes and so forth. I said, I'll print it. I went to the Arizona State University print shop, and I had them print 100 copies. This was a notable expense for me at the time. I was just out of library school. I did not have a job yet. I was recently married. And I had no money. So it was like 70 or $80 to print 100 copies of yeah. this 40-page book in 1975. And uh, I ponied up the money, and I printed it. I sold uh, copies to anybody who wanted one for a dollar a piece. figured I would get my money back. And I was right. I did. I sold all. You yeah. sold them all. Yep. Yeah, at, the, at a convention, right? Oh. Uh, I had sold about 60 of them myself, and then I saw Rick Loomis again at a convention in Tucson and said, Rick, I have this game. I know you go to gaming conventions and stuff. Would you take it off to a big game convention and see if you can sell the rest of these for me? It was with uh, the profits. So Rick thought that was a crazy idea, but since he was a friend of mine, he would give it a try. And he went and had the tables across an aisle from uh, Gary and... Rick sold his 40 copies relatively quickly there at uh, Origins that year because they were going for a dollar apiece, and Gary was sitting across the table. Yeah, I was trying to sell it in a box for $10 a piece. Okay. And young gamers don't have much money. 
Right. So, so the, the funny thing that came out of that, Rick came back and told me, he says, you know, a funny thing happened when I was selling these, Ken. The kid came and bought the game from me on Saturday. And then on Sunday, I saw the same kid go over and ask uh, Gary what his game was about. And Gary started to explain what that other game is about. And the kid said, oh, I get it. It's like Tunnels and Trolls. <laughs> <laughs> Yes. <laughs> no, Gary and I were never friends. <laughs> wow. I, I didn't. Yeah. I never. I never had any idea. <laughs> well, he, well, he was a direct com, direct competition. Yeah. 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 Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, so, Flying Buffalo was my first gaming company. Okay. And that's, after Rick came back from the convention, he said, "Ken, I think I could sell that." So, oh, well, <laughs> uh, what do you want for the rights to the game? And I said, "Oh no, we'll make a deal. You can." produce and manufacture and sell it, but I always get royalties. Yeah, very wise. Yeah. Yep. Because I want to be a writer, right? What, how do writers make their money? Royalties. Right. <laughs> so and, I said, no, you never, you never get control of the game, Rick. The game belongs to me. But you can be the total manufacturing arm and set the prices, and that what became the beginning of a beautiful uh, partnership that has lasted to this day. Yeah. So you were into it right at the boom then, it sounds like, of the whole gaming thing, right? Because it was it, it, it kind of seen its heyday, what, late 70s and then into the early 80s, right? It's up to the mid-80s probably. Mid-80s? Yeah. Yes. That's awesome. Yes, that's I was timely. there pretty much from the beginning. Yep. Before that other game happened, I was already playing uh, diplomacy through the mail, uh, play-by-mail diplomacy games. I was running... Uh, a couple of my own. It's funny. I already had this concept of cooperative gaming where groups of people would get together to do things. Right. Yeah. It's just that we could take uh, what would take months in a diplomacy game to work out and make it happen in a couple of hours in a face-to-face talk because right. we weren't moving little figures around Right. Right. in inches and uh, trying to see if there's a clear line of sight. Well, if Game Master says that you can see uh, your foe, you can cast your take that you can spell it. Right. Now, people that you knew or heard of that was interested in playing war games, especially the the miniature type as opposed to the hex-based type, um, did you find in your experience that those people were just as easily drawn to a game like the one that you had made that was a storytelling vehicle as opposed to a game that had its roots in miniature warfare combat? Just the opposite. Really? So there was like a resistance to it? There was, well, just never much contact between me and the miniatures gamers. Okay. I was aware of them. They're so invested in their elaborate set and their miniatures and they're painting that uh, role playing is secondary uh, at best. Secondary, tertiary, maybe. Yeah, yeah. Um, then uh, there are the role players who really love their miniatures, but they're not miniatures gamers. They're really role players who like to move their miniatures around and uh, show off their beautiful little painted elf or whatever they may have. Yeah, sure. Yeah. So. so- yeah, there's not really much connection there. I, I For years, in terms of miniatures in RPGs, I generally just used anything. Dice, coins, miniatures that didn't matter or fit the situation, just to mark out the tabletop boundaries. Um, but later on, I got interested in the hex-based war games. Uh, so I never really got into the actual hardcore miniature type war games, but but the ones that like the, from Avalon Hill and SPI, those seem really appealing uh, because they're quick enough to assemble and get people going and actually have a game, and you don't have to have all of the accoutrements like a sand table and, and a place to keep things set up where cats don't destroy it and things like that, you know. <laughs> You're just like me. <laughs> You're just like me. You think exactly the same way I do. Let me punch out a bunch of pieces, put them on the hex, uh, move that stack. Yeah, uh, yeah. Consult the combat resolution table on a die roll and 
Uh-oh. And you're off. <laughs> Move on to my next piece of strategy. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Right right now I'm playing a theater level um, Axis and Allies game with some friends. It's um, the second edition of Europe and Pacific 1940 put together. So the table is as long as a medium-sized car and about as thick the, the board is. Um, but, but I certainly enjoy it. Well, that's a level of dedication that I never reached. <laughs> I've had some people tell me that it's just you know every few weeks we we we'll spend the day doing it and stuff. <laughs> and you know that that's really illustrative of a, of a point is attainability, accessibility. Because um, whereas a fantasy role playing type game is a lot more accessible than setting up maps and having hundreds and hundreds yeah. of pieces and and stuff like this. And and then and then a game that if it doesn't resolve. Uh, in a timely manner, can you even leave it set up? Yeah. It's like a role-playing game. You can say everybody grabs their sheets and their papers. We'll see you next week kind of thing. Yeah. Right? <laughs> so it's funny. You were talking, uh, Ken, about um, conventions earlier, and we had talked with uh, Michael Dobson last week and had asked him. Uh, sp- or, or we had, had made the announcement that we were getting ready to have you on the show, and he had given us an interesting story apparently about him and some friends of his were trying to drive to a convention, and they were driving through Phoenix, and their car broke down. And just on a whim, the only person they knew, any any person that they knew, uh, uh, Michael said, was you. And just on a lark, he, he thought, well, it can't hurt. I'll try to reach out to this guy. And he said that. Um, that you were extremely helpful. You, you, um, I guess you got them to the bus stop uh, so that they could grab the bus and, and still make the convention and that you kind of hung out and chatted with them a while um, and showed them some hospitality. So um, it, it's, a, it's a memory he had that he looked back very fondly of, and, and uh, we said we would certainly mention it to you and didn't know if you had even, re- if you even remembered um, that this happened or not. Yes, I did remember it. Uh, I didn't remember the names of the people that uh, I saw that night, but I, I think I got a phone call and I invited them to come over. So they made it to my house somehow. And um, they said they were going to, well, I thought they were going to Los Angeles. Yeah, I think it was a convention in Los Angeles. Yeah. Or a convention in Los Angeles. It was a Lost Con or something, uh, <laughs> one of the regular Los Angeles conventions. We had supper. I gave them something to drink. We talked for a couple of hours, and uh, it didn't indicate they were broke. They were just going on. I don't right. think they took a, bu- a bus or anything. I just, you know, showed them a map and I uh, said, this is the way you go. <laughs> uh but, yeah, uh, sorry, guys, I would love to come with you, but, you know, I have to work in the morning. Right. right. Yeah. <laughs> Can't just gallivant off to L.A. <laughs> yeah, it's just amazing to me how there's moments in time that things happen like that, that people come together and and it stays in their memory. And by staying in their memory somehow connects that event to a more present event like this one where we're we're talking about it and it's been brought back from the past and and uh i don't know it kind of manifests again and echoes again in your life and and may make a difference you know that's how i think about it when i when i think about things like that there's a lot of weird connections where things are connected together where you wouldn't expect them to be and uh i don't know i just think that's interesting that's neither here nor there but (laughs) Well, that, and everything that, is connected, guys. Yeah, yeah, that, and that whole conversation, uh, I think, was predicated with Michael because he was talking about the family or the community of sci-fi, right? And and authors and things like that, and how um, you know there there is a there is like a communal or community out there, yeah. people that with mutual respect and stuff like that. So he was a fan. Um, it's kind of how it started with him making the phone call, if I remember right. I have to go back and listen to that podcast mm-hmm. again. I'm not sure now. But anyway, um, so uh, when you – so after you did this, uh, you went on and, and published books too, correct? Not, it wasn't just the, the fantasy gaming stuff. Was there, was there subsequent novels and things that followed that as well? There are um... – it came quite a bit later. Okay. Okay. So during the seventies, you know, the major innovation I think 
and what uh, helped tunnels and trolls survive was the solitaire adventure. Mm, yeah. TNT is a game that invented the concept of solo role play. You don't need a group. You don't need a game master. You just have you, your dice, and your book. And the paragraph, it tells you what to do. You follow the instructions, and you uh, work your way through the story. Oddly enough, Steve McAllister, the guy who helped me invent the magic spells, came up with that idea. He said, you know, we could do something like this with programmed instructions. And he showed us that. Uh, Rick Loomis went home and wrote the first uh, solo adventure called Buffalo Castle. Huh. And I wrote the second one called uh, Naked Doom. I read... Voila, we, we soon had a whole bunch of solo adventures going and gave him more products to sell at right. And uh, gave Tunnel Controls kind of a way of standing out from that other game because we could do something they couldn't. I've read reviews recently uh, where people are still talking about that and how useful that is to to starting off if you haven't done this before. And, and I know, at least back in the day, um, when uh, my day when I first started playing, um, it wasn't always easy to find a group. Um, you had to find somebody who had a DM. You know, you might know somebody who knew somebody, but nobody had ran a game sometimes, and then it seemed like that was difficult. And uh, so having that experience of knowing how to do what, what it is that you would be doing if you were running a game would be invaluable to people because it would allow them to take the mantle of the game referee on, you know, and to their local friends, that must look pretty neat. And I also think that the ability to play solitaire play, if I'm – and you correct me if I'm wrong here, Ken, but that it, that would prepare you for group play, would it not? Yeah, so that, you yeah. could sort of play test the game ahead of time. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. While you were waiting yeah. for a group. Yes. Uh, a lot of people have told me that they started with Tunnels and Trolls, that it was, oh, a few said they, it saved their sanity or got them through high school because they lived in uh, Podunk Junction, North Dakota, <laughs> and couldn't find another gamer within 50 miles. Yeah, definitely. I, 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 yeah. <laughs> and still participate. Right. And, um, yeah, if you, if you start thinking of it as being a game master of the game you're running in, that you're running these characters, it, it does develop the ability to coordinate things. Yeah, it definitely teaches a skill that is a weird, unique skill. It's very akin to maybe being a director of a stage performance, but, but without all the physical activity, right? Like you have to still visualize how things are going to flow and work together. But that, you know, it helps with that. It does. So the 70s was, uh, and the 80s were mostly solo adventures. Okay. That, and I tried to write as many as I could, and we brought other people in to write them. We started up a magazine to support our own efforts called Sorcerer's Apprentice. It lasted about 20 issues. It did not go on to last forever like the traffic did. But um, it was big and it was, did some things first that uh, the Dragon hadn't done yet. For example, I talked professional science fiction writers into giving us stories. Oh, wow. Who was so I had I published Carl Wagner and Tana Lee in my gaming magazine back when I was the editor in the first few issues, long before uh, any big name writers came to work for that other magazine. <laughs> uh, but uh, Tunnel Controls also did the first fantasy role playing calendar. Oh, that's cool. We did it with black and white art. And uh, a small print run of a couple hundred uh, with, you know, big boxes so that you could write things in under individual dates and um, an illustration from a different artist uh, that you would hang up on the wall so that you would see your dragon or troll or whatever it was. Uh, a lot of them were naked fantasy babes. Seems Those to... were the days when you could have naked Eight. fantasy babes. Right, right, yeah. The late 70s, early 80s. <laughs> Yes. Gosh, what was um? God, I remember um, Heavy Metal Magazine and Omni. 
Oh, they were great. Yeah, man. Omni not so much, but heavy metal. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, heavy metal. <laughs> heavy metal. I well waited for it month after month. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, Mobius. Uh, some of the European artists who had were not fettered the way American artists were. Right. Uh, they were inspiring. Yeah, yeah, definitely. So, <laughs> uh, oh my God, I can remember staring at pictures in that magazine forever. <laughs> The detail, the artwork, the strangeness of the whole thing. It was like, yeah, yeah the strangeness, it's, like with, it's, with Mobius and stuff. Yep. Like, every, it was like he didn't just paint something, but, like, he picked this weird angle when he would do it. And, and, and all the angles made you kind of feel like you were right there somehow. Right. It was very first person. At least for me, that's how I viewed his art in those books. Uh, how did you feel about it, Ken? Oh, I, I agree with you. Mobius was great. Uh, that's the first place I saw any Richard Corbin. Ah, ah. And he did some, uh, what movies? Was heavy metal. And, and he did fantasy, but he did really primitive, brutal fantasy. Yeah. He wasn't, you know, hung up on the Middle Ages. Mm-hmm. Gotcha. Yeah. <laughs> he was hung up on other things. Yeah. yeah. But, um, oh, yeah. It was the golden age, uh, the seventies and the eighties. We don't see that. I I don't know what we would compare today. We there's nothing like that today that I can think of. There's no um, avant garde or, or really any art that's like with heavy metal. There was all kinds of stuff in it, and they went they sort of collected it all, like right. And today, it was an anthology. They all they wanted was quality. Yeah. Yeah. And you some of the stuff was virtually unreadable, and some of it <laughs> just pulled you along like uh, water skiing. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Yeah. yeah, it was an amazing time. Uh, but now with, uh, and we went into we went into uh, detail with this before, but uh, we were talking about um, self publication and just in the way that the things have changed today with technology and the ability to self publish and to co and to collaborate with things like um uh not twitter um what am i thinking of skype and, and stuff RPG. like that lulu lulu yeah uh, yes we are now in the golden age of self publication and as long as we're talking about that can i get a plug in here absolutely, absolutely. okay i have been working on uh, publishing my own Tunnels and Trolls material and related material since about 2011. I uh, made up a name for this enterprise. I call it Trollhalla Press. Love uh, there are still some Tunnels and Trolls adventures that can only be obtained directly from me. And there, I self-published them. I took them to the cheapest printer I could find whenever I was ready to do it and had them run off 100 copies, tried to sell them through the mail. Some of them got picked up by Flying Buffalo and are available through Flying Buffalo. Um, that's all past history. The point I want to make is that Trollhalla Press still exists. I moved it and created it as an entity on Drive-Thru RPG. So if you go to Drive-Thru RPG and you look for Ken St. Andre or you look for Trollhalla Press, you will find... Uh, something like 17 individual items that are not available through Flying Buffalo or any other place. And if you just search Tunnels and Trolls, you will find other small presses that have picked this up and do things using the TNT rule set. All available because Drive Through and Lulu made self-publishing practical and affordable for the average person. That's amazing, man. That's you know, I love the fact that it can give direct con from the content from the creator uh, directly to the people like that. Right. Publisher yeah. doesn't want to do it. I don't care. Right. I'm <laughs> going to do it, and uh, I'm going to put it out there. One of the things I'm going to do this year, I hope, he said, crossing his fingers, <laughs> is the game designer's cut of Deluxe Tunnels and Trolls. The Deluxe Tunnels and Trolls product that Flying Buffalo put out in 2015 that we started with a Kickstarter in 2013 and is acclaimed to be the ultimate, most fantastic ever edition of the game. And it is. 
<laughs> um, is not exactly the way I wanted it to come out. But as I was part of a committee there and majority rules, it came out the way it did instead of exactly the way I wanted it to. I've given them a couple of years to get all their sales, and now I want to do the game designer's cut. Flying Buffalo will not want to do that. Okay. But once I get it, once I get it uh, whipped into shape, I can put it on Full Hall of Press on drive Through. And all 12 of my real fans can find it. <laughs> now, what is, what would, I mean, do you, can you briefly, without giving anything terribly away, what would be the difference between those two editions? In essence, uh, in essence, what you would be doing differently? The rules would be pretty much the same. It's almost too picky. I don't think uh, an average reader would understand what I'm going for. The major difference between the two editions will be the wording. Okay. Uh, I wrote a complete set of rules for Deluxe Tunnels and Trolls. My editor kept a few sentences here and there and rewrote them uh, in her more diplomatic fashion. Um, I have sometimes been accused of being undiplomatic with the way I say things, that uh, I hurt people's feelings, I say things that shouldn't be said, I let the cat out of the bag. Um, other faux pas that may hurt somebody's sales, well, screw them. Uh, sometimes I just want to tell the truth the way I see it. Sure, yep. sure, why not? And you can today, the way you want it, to tell it. <laughs> it's interesting. So can that... uh, when I do the game designer's cut, it's going to go back to the original way I wanted to have things expressed, not the diplomatic way that... Uh, exactly my editor decided they should be expressed. Well, they're looking for I, mass market appeal versus where, where you're okay. trying to say, hey, I've got a message and I don't want it adulterated here. And they're going, well, if we just adulterated a little, more people might buy it kind of thing. So that's that influence, right, between the exactly. artist and, and, their, and their audience. It's it's really this is a really interesting topic because boy this just keeps coming up and just keeps yeah. coming up and with the self publishing and everything and it's in it and the reason one of the reasons why Eric and I parked our podcast uh, with the X Factory was because that's an outlet for artists to be able to go and bring their art to the mass populace and and not have to worry about um, what some marketing director thinks of the whole thing kind kind of situation yeah. So it's it's everywhere. It's in everything now. And, and like um, me and you were talking about, Ken, about how a lot of attempts have been made to uh, record people's stories about this particular time period and this particular uh, culture. And uh, some of these efforts are still tied up in legal battles in court um, with podcasting, you know, by the next day. It's for the whoever wants to hear what the story is directly from the person's mouth, right? right. There's there's no in between at all, uh, and I find that to be an interesting situation. I've talked with other people about that, other guests, and I think that there's a bit of an appeal to that. There's a lot of appeal to it. You see it in movies sometimes, where some secret piece of information has to be suppressed, or the bad guys will. Uh, be revealed to the world and their plot will be foiled. But that information only exists on one disc or, you know, one book or something. If they can just destroy that one piece of information um, or that one witness, they're safe. Right. Well, that's silly. You know, if there's only, if it only exists in one place like that and that's what makes you vulnerable, the obvious answer is to go and get it published immediately. Get it out there. Put it out in the world. Does it do any good to kill Karen Page if she's already told her story about how the kingpin is ruling uh, Hell's Kitchen and half of New York City? Yeah. So that's what we need to do. In fact, you know, just in general, artists and people who have things to say, they need to say it. Yep. Yeah. They need to put it out there on the Internet and make it available for people to see. Yeah, yeah, because I was, I was telling Matt, I said, the people the people that we're talking with they're truly interesting people and 
the work that they do is like 10% of who they are. Like I've failed to talk with anyone who isn't so much larger than what their work it represents them as. You know what I'm saying? Yes. So that's, for me, that's why I have an interest in, in talking with people in general. You know, I do want to hear, you know, how did you, how did you grow up? You know, how did you get into this? And what were the things in your life that brought yeah, you to What are your motivations? End? Yeah. Yep. Because that's the, well, escape. you know, yeah. Joseph Campbell <laughs> said that the artists of our day were the people who gave us our new mythology. And if anything, the technology increases so fast we always need our mythology redefined for us we always need to look through the eyes of an artist because uh it's our human connection with all of this technology that is around us or at least that's how i feel uh, yeah, I, couldn't... I think you're exactly right i won't argue with anything you said there. <laughs> okay. and i couldn't agree with you more though that that, that the people need to be i think it i think it, it, there needs to be less middlemen, for lack of a better term. You know, it's it, it, this. Everything's been sugar coated for way too long, and uh, uh, and and this is this is speaking in a global sense that you're saying, Ken, not just in the sense of publishing books or, or designing games. You're saying, period, that, that the artists and people that they need to start saying more. Yes. Yes, they need to say it before they can be shut up. More totalitarian countries in the United States only survive by shutting people up. When the truth or the viewpoint comes out and reaches a wide audience, uh, things change. Yep. Nelson Mandela is perhaps the prime example of that in the 20th century. Yep. Well, it's the, uh, uh, the saying goes, right, um, if you want to know who's really in charge, um, it's the person you're not allowed to criticize. Okay. That's so, it. And, that, and, 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 and the only way you're going to find that out is by criticizing, <laughs> <laughs> is by talking, right? Yes, it's true. Well, you said promise me I could talk about all the things I'm uh, trying to do this year. Yes, yes, please. Please, go ahead. Okay, so uh, first of all, I want to – get at least one publication out on Toll Hollow Press every month. So it won't all be Tunnels and Trolls stuff, but it will all have some kind of fantasy relationship. Right now I'm working on a book of, uh, I'm calling it character portraits, but it's really just an excuse to get a friend of mine's uh, fantasy art out there where more people in the world can see it. There's an artist named Gilead. G you can find him on Facebook. Can you? Gilead? Uh, he's an amazing guy. Gilead. Okay. Like the I'm biblical right. name. Gotcha. I'm writing it down. <laughs> uh, you should talk to him sometime. Okay. Uh, anyway, so that's the, that book is in progress right now. I have um, another friend of mine editing it and putting it together for me. I'm just going to be a publisher on this thing. I'll okay. write an introduction. Uh, I want to do the Tunnels and Trolls gamers design viewpoint like the director's got i want to do a sequel to uh, grimtina's guard which was solo i wrote for meta arcade as a giveaway product in 2016 the new uh, phone app of tunnels and trolls oh. are you guys aware that tunnels and trolls has a, a telephone app i was not sir nope okay the company is called meta arcade in 2016 the leader David Reed came to us in Scottsdale and said, I'd like to adapt Tunnels and Trolls into a, an application for smartphones and uh, tablets and computers. And we said, that's a great idea. I've wanted TNT to get uh, into an electronic format for a long time, and we've made various attempts. This was the latest, and it's still going on. It's called Tunnels and Trolls Adventures. It's available on either the Apple App Store or the Google App Store. It's free. You can download this, put it on your smartphone or your tablet. It's not available for desktops yet, which has me growling at uh, the people <laughs> uh, actually doing the stuff, the middlemen here. But they say, 
Ken, it's hard to do this stuff. It takes time and money and programmers and <laughs> and planning. And so we have to promote what we have in the meantime. And I'm going, <laughs> uh, you promised me a fantasy game. That was, <laughs> it, it, my fantasy game out there where anybody can play it and you're giving them, you know, uh, one third of it. But it is out there and a lot of people like it. You should take a look. Yep. Um, it's called Tunnels and Trolls Adventures. I am viewing it now on my phone and grabbing it. Next month's project is called Grim Tina's Rescue. I'm going to write another solo adventure. Whether or not Meta Arcade picks it up or not doesn't really matter to me. Right, um, right. I will write it. I, if Flying Buffalo wants to publish it, we'll publish it there. And if they don't want to publish it, I'll put it through Trollhalla Press. Yep. And uh, Grim Tina's Rescue will be the sequel to Grim Tina's Guard, in which you played the minion to the heroine of the story, who is on a uh, a short journey from Grim Tooth's uh, Castle of Traps uh, to uh, the temple of her goddess mother on the other side of the Forest of Doom. And, of course, you have to go through the Forest of Doom. That's never an easy thing. No. <laughs> it doesn't even sound like it would be. <laughs> uh, so uh, i let you play a troll. If you're smart, you will play a troll in this adventure. Uh, yeah, I would. <laughs> uh, but uh, you can also play a dwarf or an ogre or something. That uh, I give various characters you could from the game book. Or you can bring your own. That's the wonderful thing about Tunnels and Trolls. You can bring your own character to the game. Uh, any time you want to play it, uh, in any environment and so on. You want to take Donad the Barbarian into <laughs> uh, the Star Trek universe, you can do it. Uh, he's going to be a little out of place. So that's my big project for next month, I think, is going to be uh, Grim Tina's Rescue. Because in the first one, the most likely outcome is that Trollish girl you're supposed to be escorting safely through the forest gets captured by uh, giant uh, spiders straight out of Mirkwood and uh, carried off all wrapped up in silk while you stagger back to Grimtooth's castle and say, uh, I didn't make it. <laughs> and, uh, and now Big Brother has to go rescue his sister from the uh, spiders of the Forest of Doom. Classic. As, as is as is always the case, right? <laughs> yeah. And and, as, and since this is a solo adventure for you and not for Grimtooth, uh, Grimtooth will get sidetracked and it'll wind up being your job to finish the rescue. Uh, Grimtooth is the master, of, ultimate master of traps. Everyone knows that. Yep. What everyone doesn't know is that Grimtooth started as a mascot for Sorcerer's Apprentice magazine back in issue two or three. Ha. Huh. And he was first drawn by uh, Liz Danforth, our main Tunnels and Trolls artist. <clears throat> and uh, after we drew the first picture of him, we didn't know what his name was. So we, had a, we ran a contest for the readers of Sorcerer's Apprentice to name the troll. The person who won that this contest is currently the uh, president of CIFWA. Hmm. Well, now, wait, uh, SIGWA? SIFWA, Science Fiction Writers of America. Oh, okay, gotcha. Uh, I thought you said something else. Uh, <laughs> what? She's on Twitter. Her name is Catherine Rambo. Okay. okay. Uh, and her, her Twitter name handle is Rainbow Riot Rambo. <laughs> okay. And when right. I pulled it up right now, uh, uh, she's showing a clip from uh, Willy Wonka and the Chocolate Factory. <laughs> Rain Rainbow Riot what? <laughs> Rainbow, Riot, Rambo, R A M B O. Yeah, why okay. not? There's all Rambo goes with that. Yeah, uh, <laughs> well, that's like a tongue her, twister. So her Twitter handle, her real handle is Cat Rambo, C A T R A M B O. You were talking about connections. This was the girl who sent in a, success, a suggestion for the name of our troll. Oh, okay. She suggested Grimtooth. Huh. Now she's the president of the Science Fiction Writers of America. That's interesting. Uh, wow. <laughs> How's that for a connection? That yeah, is. That's, it's interesting. Yeah, it is. Things just keep reverberating and bouncing around. <laughs> it, I, the, that, those books, the first one in particular, was one of those 
great books in in my growing up. So <laughs> it was influential for you then. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. It was, and in fact, it was a bit uh, mythic in a way. Uh, my my introduction to that whole uh, Grimtooth Trap series was through a, a DM who was an older fellow than I was, and it was strictly hands off dungeon master's book to the point of if you push the point there would be some violence involved in us young men so you know it was one of those things and i didn't know how to get it at the time and stuff so it was just one of those books that i desperately desperately wanted to see the inside of but was never allowed and until finally i was able to hunt one down and purchase it and and then, you get your own copy oh yeah you know so they became big deals for me in that in my particular mythology of, of gaming and stuff all of the Traps book collected into a single volume. The Grimtooth's Ultimate Traps Anthology. Okay. It's, it's, it's out from Good, Goodman Games. Goodman Games, okay. I have a copy because I was editor of Sorcerer's Apprentice Magazine. Uh, I wrote some of the first traps that are okay. uh, the fabulous $500 edition. Oh, wow. But, uh, in slipcase with the Boss Dragon Hide cover. All the really good stuff. Wow. And I'm in it because I wrote traps for several of the early traps books. Yeah. You have to go back and search hard to find them. But uh, I wrote the great uh, octopus trap, great tentacle trap, where you're caught in a uh, glass tube underwater. <laughs> uh, and Cthulhu's for the future, I think, is that if we can get tunnels and trolls into the hands of millions of players instead of a few thousands through a phone app, it may persist into the 21st century. It's definitely meeting the audience where they are right now, that's for sure. Yeah. Phone apps, absolutely. Oh, but I, did, I didn't tell you about Elvin Lords, did I? No, uh -uh. Well, who? I should, I should miss Elvin Lords. Okay. Elvin Lord is a Kickstarter that Flying Buffalo put out last week to reproduce a very limited edition uh, solo adventure that appeared back in the 80s done by Liz Dipp and Mike Sackpole. We're updating it for the Deluxe Tunnels and Trolls rules, which are just slightly different from the old 5th edition or 7th edition rules <laughs> through Kickstarter. The main attraction will be uh, Ms. Danforth's art, which remains incredibly beautiful. That is... And the main writer will be Michael Stackpole, who is a New York Times best-selling author, creator of Star Wars novels and uh, many, many fantasy books. So we need lots of people coming in saying, oh, well, we're in. But, uh, <laughs> right, right. Gosh, you should give us more for the fact that now that you have, you know, uh, 500. Yeah. Yeah, we hopefully, yes, I, I absolutely agree. And hopefully there are people who have not even maybe ever experienced an RPG before. It'd be really nice because there's a bit of a renaissance going on with people being interested in tabletop pen and paper RPG games. Um, and this would be a great entry for those types of people. And that would be my personal uh, hope is that the people, you know, those people would be interested in it. Mine too. And uh, at that point, I want to say thank you, Will Wheaton. <laughs> <laughs> no kidding, right? Thank you, Will Wheaton, for uh, um, putting this out in the public eye again. Yep. Letting people know that everything doesn't have to be a computer game on your screen. You yes. can actually play face-to-face. -face. Uh, another project I wanted to mention is called the Japan Adventure, where we took uh, Tunnels and Trolls is big in Japan. Did you huh. know that? No, I did not. I did not. There's a lot of things I like that is for some reason, though. Look up the song Big in Japan by Tom Waits. Tom Waits, yeah. And uh, it'll give you a good laugh. Okay. And then think of it as Tunnels and Trolls. <laughs> okay. Okay, but uh, it's big in Japan right now, and we're working very closely with the Japanese to produce more and more of uh, our TNT stuff over there. Check my Facebook page for yesterday. You'll see a mention of uh, a couple of the latest things that they've done. Yes. Well, we've done something where we've taken the Japanese and brought it back into English, and that will come out in March. And another thing we're doing that I'd like people to know about is I've created a really short, like eight pages version of the Tunnels and Trolls rules that we're going to publish with any Tunnels and Trolls product from now on. So if you don't know how to play the game and you don't have the 
368-page Deluxe Tunnels and Trolls edition that came out in 2015. Now, you could still pick it up and play it with the eight pages that I've got given you with every product we're going to release from now on. Wow, yeah, like a nice quick start rules, too. A quick hit the ground running. I'd like to see that other game do that. <laughs> <laughs> now they have a large, large corporate entity behind them. So I think those are the things I wanted to, to bring out. Lords, Japan Adventures, uh, Trollhalla Press, and I'm still alive and kicking. I'm available <laughs> to be found on Twitter as Troll Godfather. There's a joke there. Okay. <laughs> what, what is the joke? <laughs> uh, let me make you a deal you can't refuse. And you better not refuse it because... <laughs> <laughs> oh, a friend of mine named... Uh, Moonwolf, who does digital art, made a an image for me of it looked like uh, Marlon Brando as the Godfather mm -hmm. uh, with a blood stain on his uh, stomach, <laughs> and she called it a uh, troll Godfather. <laughs> nice. <laughs> it's his icon. With her permission, yeah, I yeah. use that as my avatar on Twitter. Yep. So you know, people can and get that whole underworld crime connection going there. That risky vibe, right? Absolutely. On Facebook, I am also reviving the fan club for some 14 years called Troll Holla. If you look up Troll Holla on Facebook, you can join it. So, <laughs> yeah, no, I want to invite people to come see me on Facebook. Friend me there. Okay. I'll friend almost anybody. Okay. Uh, it's a non political site. Right. So, and be uh, forewarned, right? <laughs> and, <laughs> don't, yeah. Don't bring your crap, is what you're saying, right? Yeah. Hey, you'll, you'll, you, if you start posting, you know, uh, Trump stuff or Hillary stuff or, you know, uh, anybody else, the Ayatollah stuff on my site, uh, <laughs> bang, you're gone. Yeah, <laughs> right on. Very wise. <laughs> so uh, Trollhalla is about games and gaming, particularly Tunnels and Trolls, but uh, you can talk about anything you want except that other game. <laughs> right on. There's plenty of other spaces to talk about that other game anyway. Yeah, so yeah. Get, that no sense. Game, uh, right. That other game has me outnumbered a thousand to one. Yeah, go in take the real it. world. Take that stuff uh, over there. So if you want to talk about that other game, go talk to the other thousand people. Right. It's for it's for loyalists and for purists over here, right? Is is right. And for people who are just interesting in general. Yep. Uh, I especially want to encourage any artists who are listening to this to get in touch with me. I'm always looking for new artists okay, yeah. who work cheap uh, because uh, despite my worldwide popularity as a game designer for Tunnels and Trolls and Wasteland and Stormbringer and a few other things that nobody's ever heard of. <laughs> uh, for example, I did a rollerball game. Oh, Based really? On the movie. Like the, yeah, yeah. yeah, the movie, yeah. Not the remake, the, the real movie. Right, right. right. The original I didn't movie. even know there was a remake. <laughs> with James Caan, you right. know, back in yeah. the 70s, whenever it was, or the 80s. Uh, I did a game called Starfaring that was meant to be a different kind of uh, role-playing game for science fiction fans. In Starfaring, which was a game I did uh, right after I did Tunnels and Trolls, you play the ship. To really stretch my imagination to make the most science fictional game I could come up with, complete with rules for creating solar systems and alien monsters and the whole bit, so that you could take your role-playing to outer space and do it uh, sort of solitaire because... Uh, you're going to play a ship going off into unexplored corners of the galaxy. That's neat. I like that you play the ship. <laughs> and uh, the ship has a captain and a gunsman, a gunner, and an you know, engineer, and so forth. Yeah. Oh, Star Trek. And it's called yeah. Starfaring. Starfaring. Is my game. Okay, got it. Tunnels and Trolls isn't the only thing. We didn't talk about Wasteland at all. No. But Wasteland did spring from Tunnels and Trolls. In what fashion? A guy named Bob Liddell was going to California to try to get a job with Interplay. He stopped at in Phoenix to talk to me about Tunnels and Trolls before he went on to talk to Brian Fargo. He talked to me uh, two nights earlier, went over to California and talked to Brian Fargo uh, trying to get a job with Interplay. He didn't get the job, but it about Tunnels and Trolls. Brian about designing a post-apocalyptic role-playing game. Yep. Hey, Ken, 
Ken? Yes, I'm here. I'm so sorry. Um, we're, yeah, we're that's your job. Maybe getting every third word at this point. Yeah. Maybe oh, we well. should call you back or something and try to just get a better connection. It's it's getting it's getting pretty to the point where we can't really even hear what you're saying. Yeah, <laughs> I'm sorry. That's okay. Uh, let's do this. Let's cut it off here. And what I'd like. And we lost you again. Oh, your. Uh... Yep, not hearing you, Ken. Sorry. Let's go to Facebook, and I'll tell you this. Cut to okay. Show Facebook. Okay. Bye. Bye. And it was at this point, ladies and gentlemen, that the evil empire finished jamming Ken's cell phone, and we lost him completely. Yeah. It's, yeah. But... But we will be back <laughs> with Ken in a couple of months or so, and we will talk further with Ken. So, but we won't give an exact date because we don't want everyone to know. <laughs> so they won't do jam we? it again, right? <laughs> so we right? do want everyone to know. <laughs> Sorry for the technical difficulties, such as life when dealing with modern technology, and uh, we'll see you next time. Thank you. Bye. Bye.